Thank you. Please go ahead and be seated. Man, wasn't that a great time of praise and worship? Man, give the Lord a hand for that. Wow. Mm, Sarah did a great job on that one too as well. Amen. Well, what a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I'm excited that you are here. I want to say hello to all those who are watching us on our live stream this morning and pray that the spirit in your place, wherever it is you're watching from, is just as powerful as it is here this morning sitting in this congregation with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And man, it is great, great, great to see all of you here. And I want to continue today with the, the idea of church being the place to be. What can we do to make this the place to be? And so as we as we look at this, the idea of the, that I want to share with you this morning, first of all, is the responsibility is not placed on the world to become aware of the church's uh, importance. We sometimes, I think, as the church, want to say, well, it's up to them, it's up to the world to realize how important we are or how much they need us. But my friends, can I share with you this morning that I believe it's rather the church's job to realize our role in society and make ourselves prevalent, prevalent there. But it's up to us to get this the place to be. To let the world know how important the church is and what the message is that we as the church have. And that is that Jesus Christ saves. And what what are we going to do in order to get that to happen? I've been sharing with you the last few weeks about how we are to make this the place to be. And what I want to look at today is basically whose we are. And I was amazed whenever this week that I began to look over as I put this message together and got the outlines all together over the last several weeks. And, and I began to look and see the, the, the lineup of the music that was going to be played during this service today. And man, I began to rejoice right there and praise the Lord together right there in my office thinking, man, God, it's like you had a plan today. Because every song that we have, especially those last two, is almost like boom, 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 here they are. Here's the message, and this is going to confirm that message, that we as as God's people, we need to remember whose we are. Amen? Because we are not like the world. We are not of the world. But having, having Christ in our lives makes us different. It doesn't make us any better. As I've shared with you so many times before, as I've served as pastor here, that I do not believe that we as Christians are any better than anybody else. I believe that we are sinners saved from grace, amen, saved by grace, and that we are here and that we are here only because of what Jesus Christ has done. We're not better than the than the most lost, lost person. We're just better off, amen, because we have Jesus in our lives and we have somebody there that loves us. Today, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 7 as we look and see to make this the place to be is it will happen when we begin to, as the church, remember whose we are, whose we are. Let's go ahead and stand, if you can, in honor of reading God's word this morning. Starting at verse 1 in Galatians chapter 4, it says this. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from the slave, though he is master of all, but is under a guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to just enter into this time of worship. And God, what a great time of praise and worship we had. Thank you for the message that was given. Thank you for uh, Patrick and the group leading us to the very foot of the cross through worship. And God, I pray now that as I step forward here that this will just be a, a, a sweet continuation of the message that we've already heard. And the Father is always the words that I'm about to say. I pray, God, these are not my words. 
I pray that this message that was prepared was not my message and will not be my message, but Father, is your message. And I pray that the response would be from your folks as you desire for it to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. As we look at this text, we find out basically that there are two groups of people. Now, I understand that when we say, what are the classifications or what are the groups of people in this world, we always say male and female. Now, of course, in our society today, they're trying to say there's more than two groups. There's all sorts of whatever you want to identify as. But listen, there's two groups of people as far as male and female. Amen. You're either male or you're female. That's it. Nothing in between. Nothing short. Nothing long of anything. You're male or female. But that's not what we're looking at here in our text today. Basically, the Bible tells us here there are two groups of people. And you fit into one of these two categories. Again, there's not variations of these categories. You are either one or the other. And you folks at home, the same thing. And what it is, is the Bible declares that that, that you are either a slave to sin, which means basically you do not have Christ in your life, that you are now being controlled and, and basically brought out by the things of this world, and that you're a slave to that, which means you have no choice but to do what the world wants you to do but then the other category is the children of God you are either a slave to sin or a child of God we've been singing about that the last couple of songs amen so you fit into one of those two categories and if we are in the one then that means that we are lost and we need Jesus in our lives if we're if we're the child of God and we fit into this other category then my friends we have the power of God working through us. Now, I hear a lot of people, and I've shared this many times as well. Out in this world, this sweet sentiment that I hear all the time says, oh, we're all God's children. We're just all, everybody on the planet, we're God's children. Folks, can I tell you, that's not scriptural. We're God's creation. All of us are created by God in his image. But we are not all children of God. We are a child of God when we receive Jesus into our life by having our sins forgiven and him taking those sins from us and we begin to become adopted into the kingdom. Those are the children of God. So what I want to look at very quickly here today is I want to look at these two categories. The first one is slaves to sin. The Bible tells us, but it it was under garden stewardship by the 20th time of the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the enemy elements of this world. So when we are slaves to sin, basically we are held in bondage. Now the world will tell you that they are free. And they are free to live however they want. There's no guidelines. Anything goes. Whatever is going on in their life, that's good. That it is we who are Christians that are giving everything up and we don't know what real life is anymore. Can I tell you something? The Bible tells us that when we are free in Jesus, if the Son of God has set us free, we are absolutely, unequivocally free indeed. Amen? That we are the ones who are free. The world is held under a bondage of sin. In other words, they don't have a choice to be who they are or do what they do because that's what it is. It's held in bondage. Now, what is bondage? Well, first of all, bondage is is a burdensome weight. uh, uh, Bondage is heavy. And when we are trying to survive in this world as people who are lost, then what happens is we're burdened by the by weight of sin. And we, we are having this heavy load put upon us. And once this load is upon us, folks, we can't bear it. I hear people all the time who want to say, oh, God will not put on me more than I can bear. Listen to me. That's not true. We are, we have heavy weights on us if it's caused by the world. We are in that bondage and we are forced to, to carry whatever it is and we carry it by ourselves. Oh, we want to try to, man, I see the world dumping it off, trying to dump all the responsibilities onto someone else because they don't want to carry this bondage. But can I tell you, the Bible Bible says, apart from Jesus Christ, you will bear every weight of sin in your life. It is you and it is up to you and it's heavy. But not only that, it's grievous, which means it's basically serious and lacks joy. Folks, can I tell you there's no lasting joy in the things of this world? None. 
We try, and, and people, I see it, and, and I see people, and even I've done it in my life before I became a Christian, that I would try to grab onto so many stuff. Man, I'd bounce around from one thing to the next, and I see people even today jumping around from one thing to the next, trying to find something that's going to give them meaning, something that's going to give them hope, something that's going to give them something in their life they can hold on to. But I want to tell you today, the Bible tells us that if we are held in bondage, that we have lack of joy in our lives, and there is no such thing as lasting joy apart from Jesus. But when we are slaves to sin, there is no joy. Look around the world today. Patrick described it just a few moments ago of all the things that that the world tells you that you're supposed to be afraid of. Folks, there's no joy in this world anymore. Amen? Look around. It doesn't take long to see that there's a joyless society out there. There's nothing to have joy about. Apart, though, we know from Jesus Christ. So a slave to sin is held in bondage, but also has no hope. There's no joy because nothing is fulfilling you. Nothing lasts. It's only temporary. You might have it for a moment, and then it's gone. And the next thing you know, you need to have more and more and more to find even a little piece of something in your life to give you joy. But then there is no hope. And here's the thing that we've got to understand. If you are a slave to sin, there's nothing you can do on your own to get change the condition. You can strive for stuff. Folks, you at home, you can do anything you want. If you are a slave to sin, there's not a thing you can do on your own to make it different. As a matter of fact, let's look at verse 3 again. It says, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Do you know what the elements of this world is? The elements of this world is that rule and influence of Satan and his demons. I shared in the first service, listen, my friends, and I believe with all my heart, I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe that we are fighting spiritual battles right now in our nation. And I believe there are demons who are, who are running around, and I believe that they are controlling situations and controlling things and causing fear and, re- and wreaking havoc on society. I believe it, it, it's, it's a spiritual warfare. And I believe that, that God is trying to, uh, is striving and fighting for the very soul of our, of our nation, of our world, and the soul of, of those who are lost. Satan wants to keep them lost. God sent Jesus to save them, and Satan isn't giving them up. So I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe, as a matter of fact, that we as the church need to understand who it is we're fighting. The Bible says, remember, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against demons and principalities. Because here's why God wants us to remember that. Because if we're thinking, and if any of you here, any of you watching, you're thinking that we're really fighting those people out there, we're fighting society, listen, we're, we're, we're in a losing battle right there because we are going to get distracted from the true thing. Because we're going to fight people. We're going to get mad at people. We're going to argue with people. We're going to do all of this. When the Bible says that we're really wrestling against principalities and demons of this world. And we need to be praying for people. Because there is no hope in them. They are acting only the way they know how to act. We hear stories all the time of people who have owned these wild exotic animals and bears and lions and tigers and all this other stuff. And, and we get, we, we, then we find out that at one point or another, these wild animals attack their owners. And you know what is amazing to me is how people are shocked about that. We never thought it would happen. Well, my, my first question is, what did you own? You owned a bear. You owned a lion. What do you, what do they do naturally? They eat people. Amen? So why are you shocked that someone says, I own a bear and one day they say that bear got after them? Because the bear was only doing that which the bear knows to do. So my friend, listen to me. The world is doing only that which the world knows to do. Because they are under bondage. If you're here today or you're watching today and you don't have Christ, you are in bondage to the elements of this world, which is Satan and his demons. So we are slaves to sin apart from Jesus Christ. Having no hope. So look what it says. Verse 3 again. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But. Oh, right there is the good news. Amen. 
There's the good news, brothers and sisters. There's the good news to the lost and dying world. That we were slaves to that sin. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive an adoption as sons. But... We were redeemed. You know what redeemed means? Redeemed means that we were purchased. Redeemed, uh, that redeemed means that we were bought, uh, that we were under this law of sin and death and that we were slaves to this sin. But Jesus Christ came and he paid the price and not of anything of our righteousness, not of anything of our goodness, but because of our faith and our trust in him and receiving him into our life, he took us, he redeemed us from that. He purchased us with a great price because we're not our own anymore. We were bought with a price. He brought us over here. And now we are no longer slaves, but we are being adopted in to the kingdom of God. That's the but. In the fullness of time, Christ died on the cross for us that we could receive him into our lives and that we could now be children of God. So that's the second group, my friend. That's what I want to get to today. That's the, really the meat of this of this that I want to share with us this morning. That we are children of God. But may I tell you again today. Not by our works or our righteousness. Wasn't because of what we do. But what he did. The Bible tells us then that we are children of God. What does that mean? It means that we were adopted. He says that you in verse verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law. That we might receive the adoption as sons. What that means is that we were brought in with the fullness of of all recipients. In other words, I was brought in the minute I received Jesus into my life. I was not his. I was his creation, but I was not his child. But the moment I received Jesus into my life, I was adopted into his family. And that means then that I was brought in as a full recipient. That means that everything that was of his, I now receive. That I don't have to work to achieve my salvation. Amen. I don't have to work to achieve God's favor. Amen. I don't have to reach higher planes of spirituality to finally get the fullness of Christ. I don't have to have it completed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Man, I hear people all the time saying, well, I'm a child of God, but I haven't been prayed through the Holy Spirit yet. I haven't received all the combination of the Holy Spirit working in my lives. And one day, oh, I hope one day to get it. No, the Bible says that I was adopted in that means i got everything amen that i don't have to work to receive more of the holy spirit the moment i received jesus into my life how much of the holy spirit did i get all of it all of it not just pieces of it so i am adopted i am brought into and having the full recipients of everything of god i don't have to work for anything the second one is that i'm an heir Air means free to enjoy the fruits of the Spirit. All of it is available to me. All the fruit of of Christ's Spirit is alive and working in me and desires to to manifest itself in me. Listen to what the Bible says in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That sounds like some pretty good stuff, amen? Can I ask you, who wouldn't want that in their lives? That's what the world is striving to get. The world wants love. The world wants love. The world wants peace and joy. Man, that's what they're fighting and striving for. The Bible says, because I'm an heir, I receive that. I now have love. I have availability of joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I have all of that available in me. Who wouldn't want that? Amen? But not only who wouldn't want it, who wouldn't want to be around a person that has that? Amen? Wouldn't that be cool to be around people like that? Wouldn't it be great if you have to go to work, not tomorrow, tomorrow's Labor Day, enjoy your Labor Day. But on Tuesday when you do go to work, wouldn't it be great, hey, wouldn't it be great knowing you were going into a place that had people full of that? Everybody say amen, that'd be pretty cool, I think. Now, okay, I'm the pastor of First Baptist West, I go to church with those, I go to work with those people every day. 
Staff, that would be a good time for you to say amen. I was complimenting you. Amen. So I, I know I'm, I've got a little bit special. Now, I don't know that they always go to work with a pastor like that. But wouldn't it be great to go? Hey, wouldn't it be great to walk into a building of a church that says this church has love, joy, gentleness, long-suffering, meekness? Those are the kind of people people would want to be around, I would hope and think. And praise God, I believe we have a big portion of that at First Baptist West. I always tell everybody, I said, I know not everybody can be a member of First Baptist West or even want to be a member of First Baptist West. I don't know why they don't, but they're not. But if you are, you got this, I hope. I hope when people walk into this building that they sense the fruit of the Spirit. Because my friends, listen to me, we are heirs of the kingdom of God. We are heirs of the kingdom of God. We have that available to us. So not only are we adopted, and not only are we heirs, oh, but here's the cool one too. Then we're protected. Wow. We are protected. Do you know what that means? Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know, listen, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. I know who I might believe and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that what I've committed. Now what I want you to look at is a couple things here. What is this idea of keep? That I know who I believe and he, now listen, it says he is able. Not I am able, he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. That means that what happens is when I become an heir, when I become adopted into the kingdom, I get Jesus Christ and I get God wrapped around me and they're holding on to me and listen to me, they're not going to let anything happen to me. I am wrapped up. I am sealed. I heard somebody one time say that if it were possible for me to lose my salvation, I would because I can't hold on to anything. Amen? As a matter of fact, If it were up to me, I can't hold on to my salvation because I can't even keep up with my keys or my phone. There you go. As a matter of fact, we have a saying here, First Baptist West, that if you're walking around and the pastor's around here somewhere, maybe outside, and you're wondering, if I lock this door, is he going to get locked out? And the answer is yes. And it's happened many, many times because, folks, I don't always carry my keys. So I lose my keys. I know where they, I know about where they are, but they're not in my pocket. So the rule is, man, if the pastor's around, don't lock the door because you're going to lock him out. So if I can't keep up with keys, who in the world would think I'd be able to keep up with my salvation? Praise God, it says, for I know whom I believe that he I can lose my salvation if if it were up to me. But listen, praise God, my salvation isn't up to me. He has sealed me with the Holy Spirit of God working in my life. Sealed me up that I don't have to worry about it. My salvation didn't come because of me. My salvation doesn't stay because of me. My salvation is because of him and it stays because of him. And it will be, and I will continue to be saved because of him. Because I know that I am persuaded that he is able. He has sealed me with the Holy Spirit of God, holding on to me, never to let me go. And he says, then not only do I keep, but he says, then that which I've committed. What have I committed? What has a person committed? When we receive Jesus into our life, what have we committed? Man, we've committed life and our eternity. Amen. I have committed my life to Christ. He saved me. And now he seals me. And whatever it is I've committed to him, he will not let it go. I have committed not only my life here, but my friend, listen to me. We who have Christ in our life, we've committed our eternity to him. And you know what? He's able to keep it. I'm not. You're not. But praise God, it's not up to us. That's why, hey, listen, that's why we as Christians, we can have peace. I don't have to always worry, is this the day I mess up bad enough to lose my salvation? I don't have to worry about that. 
I don't have to worry about it and lose joy because oh, all this tragedy around the world, God is, is forgotten about me and I'm on, I'm all alone by myself trying to get through this life with all of this. No, I don't ever have to worry about that because I know that he has sealed me up. He is protecting me, my friend. Greater is he that is in the world than he that is, uh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Listen, my friends, that's why we have peace because I'm adopted. I'm an heir and I'm protected. We are children of God. I want to end with this statement right here. My friend, we are children of the king. Let's begin to act like it. We are children of the king. If you have Christ in your life, let's begin to act like it. No fear. But having joy, peace, love, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Being those folks that people would want to be around. Because they don't have it anywhere else. We are children of the King. First Baptist West, let's begin to act like it. I'd like you to bow your heads if you're here and if you're at home. Please bow your head. I'm going to ask the the praise team to come back up here. and, And they're going to lead us. In a song, but what I want want us to do during this song is I want us to remain seated and I just want want us to, to be allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work, speak, deal with us during these next few moments as this song is being presented to us. And at any time, if God speaks to your heart and you realize you've not been a child, but you want to come to know Jesus as your Savior, then would you come this morning? Or maybe right there where you are at home, would you, would you call? Call here at the church and someone will be ready to pray for you. Pray with you. Maybe just come to the altar and say, God, renew that in me again. Let me begin to act like the child of the King that I am. And let me show that to the world. Father, in the next few moments, as the music is going to be playing, the people are going to be singing. God, use that to speak to us. In the quietness of the congregation, the quietness of those at home, use this time to speak to us. In Jesus' name. This week, very quickly before we dismiss, uh, this is the week of prayer for the Oklahoma missions. We're going to start praying from this point on. In your bulletin, there is a prayer guide there, some things, some information about Oklahoma Baptist and the Edna McMillan offering. And we're going to be starting today or tomorrow picking up and collecting anything that you feel God's given you, uh, having you give toward this offering. We'll be taking up those offerings uh, throughout the month. And so we, we have a short video that we want you to watch before before we dismiss. So let's go ahead and watch that video, guys. Roll that video. The gospel will never stop advancing, regardless of the challenges. There is no obstacle great enough to thwart God's plan for his people. Our mission continues despite our circumstances. For decades, as Oklahoma Baptists, we have sacrificially given to the state missions offering. We give out of abundance and out of scarcity. We give together because we know our neighbors need to hear. Our state needs to know that Jesus' life and death and resurrection provides hope and life to all who believe. And so we feed, we heal, we restore, we reconcile not just through an offering, but through an invitation to join God's story of salvation that is being written on the hearts of our fellow Oklahomans. Now we as Oklahoma Baptists have an opportunity to wade into the brokenness of our prison system. We want to see lives changed. What better way to do that than the distinctively Christian liberal arts education? What if that took hold in these prisons? Pastors deal with the same challenges that everybody deals with. Oftentimes, a person in the pew, they want to believe. There's no such thing as a pastor that deals with depression or struggles in their marriage. 
We want every pastor to have access to high quality support for themselves and their families in these moments of crisis. We as Oklahoma Baptist have a worldwide impact. Mission partnerships and mission trips, sometimes God calls a 16 year old, sometimes God calls a retiree. We want every Oklahoma Baptist who's serving on the field to have a connection with Oklahoma Baptist Church. Often we don't know how to help. Giving to the state mission offering is one of those ways. We do have an open door for effective service. This offering is not just about raising money, it's about wading into the brokenness. Every year, this is our moment as Oklahoma Baptists to give together where every dollar we give goes to expand the kingdom, to bring hope in the midst of despair, to bring healing in the midst of brokenness. And as we embrace that brokenness with the hope of Jesus Christ, may we always continue to advance the gospel. I'm a Baptist, and as you see, there's so much more, even just not just in Oklahoma that we do, that we we send people everywhere around the world. So this is, it helps us with our Oklahoma Baptist uh, disaster relief, uh, children's homes, everything that we have a part of. So be in prayer uh, this week about what God has for you. Take this uh, home with you and look it over, and there's some, some information in there. Uh, then you can begin to give. You can give online as well as in person. So please remember that, okay? Listen, I want to thank all of you for coming today, for being a part of our service. Thank all those who are uh, viewing us through the live stream. Thank you for being a part of our services as well. I want to remind you that Wednesday night, we kick back up with our Wednesday night activities. We're excited about that. We have a, uh, in the list, in the bulletin, we have a list of things. We have our men's Bible study starting back up. Uh, so men, we want you to come and be a part of that with us. We have our women's Bible study as well. Awana kicks off at, uh, uh, 6 30 on, on Wednesday. So if you know of any kids that want to be a part of Awana, we're doing it, uh, in person, but we're also doing it virtual. So, uh, please register and we can get all the information to you, uh, through the, for the Awana. We want to make sure kids get to be a part of Awana. Our youth recharge worship starts Wednesday night as well. So we're very excited about that. And then our prayer time, we have a, 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 a prayer meeting at six o'clock. So if you would want to come and be a part of the prayer meeting uh, in here, we'll, we'll be at 6 o'clock and it'll be upstairs. Uh, so come and be a part of that with us as well, okay? So we're getting some things going back. It's going to be a lot of excitement, a lot of fun. Uh, God's opening up doors for us that we've never had here at First Baptist West of being able to reach people, and it starts now. Amen? So really excited about it. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank all of you for joining us again on live stream, and we look forward uh, to meeting again Wednesday night. Starting at 5.30 for the meal. Uh, the envelopes are out there. I do want to remind you that the envelopes are out there if you want to pay early or call the office. And let us know if you're planning on coming on Wednesday night, okay? Look forward to seeing you then. Mm-hmm.